Let us pray. Indeed, let all glory be to Christ for what he has done. Jesus came to this world. He came from heaven, from his glory, left his glory and came here and he was spat upon. He was ridiculed. He was put on the cross, but he did it because of the love that he has for us and had for us. We thank you, Lord, that upon that cross, our sins were completely paid for. And now, as we have accepted his sacrifice, we know that we are your children, Heavenly Father, and we know this morning, like every morning when we gather together and every night we gather together, that you will speak to us from your word, and we thank you for your spirit that dwells within us and will interpret it interpret your word into our deep recesses of our hearts we pray that your presence be amongst us and you be with us all in jesus name amen let's all sit welcome back tony and i think uh, penny's around too yeah steve didn't get the chance to welcome you this morning uh i'd uh, gonna read from the old testament and a couple of weeks ago a couple of weeks ago the Jews celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, it's called the Feast of Booths, Feast of Sukkot, and it's a quite a fascinating feast. And when you look at the Jewish people and you see their, their influence, and we as Christians, obviously we go to the Old Testament and we see what they've gone through, what they, how God uses them, how Jesus came from, from the Jews, and for us, they're almost like brothers once they accept Christ. And they are just a, a people that dominate world headlines. You see them. A small country, 16 million people all over the world, Jews. Small country in the midst of a lot of enemies, just like two, three, four thousand years ago, still enemies, today still enemies, and so much influence. You know, when you know, they, something happens to them, the whole world shudders. You know, whether it's a president of the United States or whatever, everyone's trying to find a solution because of their impact. And these feasts that we're going to look at have a real significant message for us. Because embedded in these feasts is the person of Jesus Christ and his work. So we thank the Jews. You know, even though when they read the Old Testament, the Bible says, you know, when they read Moses, there's a veil that goes over their eyes because they can't see Christ. I think it might be tied up with the fact that, you know, they you know, might be proud or God's put them aside. And, you know, we've got Moses. Remember, Jesus came and said to them, you know, follow this. And they said, no, no, we've got Moses. He's our hero. And... That has caused the blindness. But one day, one day they will come to Christ. In the same way, Joseph, when he was king, when he was a prime minister of Egypt, and his brothers came to him for food, and they then recognized uh, who it was. It was their brother who was feeding them. In the same way, the Jews will come back. But in the meantime, they walk through this world, and they are dominating but hated. Look at the history. I probably don't have to tell you the history about them. But at the same time, they, they, represent, they represent the Old Testament and these feasts. And I want to go through these feasts. And there's seven feasts. But the way I'm going to handle it is that we're going to go to Leviticus 23. And I'm going to go through the feasts. And my ultimate aim is to get to the Feast of Tabernacles, the last one. And spend a bit more time on that. But you will find this, as I found it, just a fascinating uh, explanation of God's word. And, you know, the old, I've often heard there was this guy, uh, Chuck Missler, many years ago, he's passed away now, and he used to say, you know, something, he used to say, the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed. And, you know, you'll see things here. And you'll see things, oh, that makes sense, that makes sense. So we're going to read portions, we're going to stop, I'm going to give a bit of a... Uh, Discussion, and then we're going to go on to the Feast of Tabernacles. So Leviticus 23, and these are called the regular feasts. And it says, uh, Leviticus 23, 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, they are my feasts. Holy convocations. That is, when God is meeting the Jews, the Israelites. It's a meeting of their... These are holy. When God meets the person. Just think of that. Remember that. Six days you shall work, work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, Jesus comes along and he says something. You know, they criticise him because he worked on the Sabbath. And it's quite fascinating to see uh, how the Jews treat the, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. And you see them really, the Orthodox Jews in particular, there's a lot of liberal Jews, but the Orthodox Jews, they, they follow it to the T. I saw a program whereby they actually um, they leave the lights on because Sabbath starts six, at dusk of the Friday night. So they leave the lights on because, and they leave them on all night because they can't touch them because it's work if they turn them off. So if, if, uh, if there's a mistake being made whereby they've left the lights on off at home, they can't turn them on. It's quite fascinating. They take it to the letter of, of the law. Jesus comes and they criticise Jesus, but Jesus says something here that is crucial to what we're going to speak about in the feast. He says that the Son of Man, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That he was Lord of the Sabbath. And we'll see in this feast, underlining the feast is the Sabbath. And underlining the message is our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We sung this morning, all glory be to Christ. And you'll see through what we're going to see here, that it indeed, in the message here, we're going to see Jesus personified for us. We'll see him this morning, and we'll look at this part, and we'll say to the Jews at the end, and say, can't you see him? Can't you see him? But blessed be God that we can see him. And the only reason we can see him is that those of us who have repented of our sins, who have asked Jesus to be our saviour, the spirit of God has come in, has enlightened us, and we see him this morning in his word, and we see him every time we open up his word. So then we go to verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim on the important times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall be holy convocation. You shall do customary no work on it, but you shall offer, make an offering by the fire for the Lord for seven days. And the seventh day shall be holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So here we have, obviously we can see here, that the Passover is Jesus Christ dying upon the cross. And we know that. If you've grown up in this church, you cannot help but understand that that is Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. And then we have the unleavened bread coming through the day after. Jesus was the man without sin. Leavened bread uh, had leaven in it that was considered to be sinful in the Old Testament. Unleavened bread had no leaven, not sinful. And in the same way, Jesus Christ was the unleavened bread, the one who had no sin, and he paid for our sin. Let's continue. Verse 9. The Lord spoke to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land, I will give you and reap its harvest. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and you shall make an offer on that day that you wave the sheep, a male lamb of the first year, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of the ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hin. You shall ne eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God." It shall be a statute for forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So there's a lot of, you know, bread. There's a lot of um, uh, sacrifices by fire offerings. But what it is, it's considered to be 
the, the, fest, the festival of first fruits. First fruits. After, after the Passover, after the, the death upon the cross of Jesus Christ and the fact that he was in the tomb, and now we have this happening, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says in 1 Corinthians, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the first fruit. There, and that's what it says here. It's the feast of the first fruit. He's the first fruit. And then we're going to be resurrected in due course. But he's the first one. You know, the other, the other people like Lazarus uh, and a few others there who actually was resurrected by Jesus Christ, they again died. Okay, they, they died and went into the ground. But Jesus Christ was the first fruit. He was the first one to be resurrected and he went up to glory. The Father resurrected him. And we will follow. But he's the first fruit. Let's go to verse 15. And you shall count for yourselves from the day of the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheaf of the weight of offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days, note the days, to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring for yourself your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be fine flour and shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull on two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with a grain offering and their drink offering and an offering made by the fire of sweet aroma. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering. Two male lambs of the first year of the sacrifice peace offering. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest, and you shall proclaim on the same day that it shall be holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. You shall count 50 days, 50 days after the day of the first fruits. And we know 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ is Pentecost. When the disciples were gathered in the upper room and, God, and Jesus said to them, you know what you do? Go to Jerusalem, tarry there, and the promise of the Father shall come down. And they were there in the upper room. They were waiting. And all of a sudden, the glory of God came into that particular room. And they were filled with the Spirit of God they started speaking tongues, and those tongues were tongues that other people could understand, and they spoke to other people, and, you know, the people were just amazed. They were saying, you know what? What's this we hear about Jesus in our own language and tongue, about what he's done? And here we have, in this part of the chapter, we have the Pentecost, 50 days. Fifty days it happened. But there's something different here too. There's a listing of sacrifices. It talks about a bull and a ram and it talks about two male lambs and these offerings and so forth. But we as Christians know, know this, that Jesus Christ paid for our sins in full. Once he died upon the cross, no more sacrifices. The Jews still have to do it. But we understand that Jesus died once and for all. And upon the cross, he called out, it is finished. I've paid for the sins of the world. And you think, and I think sometimes that, you know, we do good works and somehow that's going to, you know, count towards our salvation. It's going to count towards pleasing God. You know, it's going to count to the fact, you know what, if I have more good works than bad works, I'm going to get to heaven. No, no, it's almost blaspheming God. Because then you're saying, you know what, the cross has no relevance. Then you're saying that, you know what, it doesn't matter whether Jesus died. I'm going to rely on what I do. But the Bible says to us this. All of us are sinners, but Jesus Christ paid for our sins in full. We are saved by grace, not of works, the Bible says. So if you trust in Jesus and you believe in him, you have been saved. You're going to heaven. 
And we only do good works and good things because we love him, because we're repaying him in a roundabout way, because we want to show to other people that we've been changed, we've been renewed by this great God and through his son, Jesus Christ. But we are saved by his grace. Beautiful word, grace. One of the, uh, a word that means so, so much depth and it, it, it illustrates and explains God to the finest degree. He's full of grace, full of mercy. Though we do things wrong, he shows us grace. You know what? If you and I do anything wrong in this world, we pay for it. We pay for it to the nth degree. You know, the Bible says well, you reap what you sow. When we do, when we do wrong, we reap what we sow. But God is full of grace and mercy. And that grace and mercy will be reflected in us too, to other people and to the way we interact with people. It's God's grace that instills in our heart and we see it here. 50 days, Pentecost. 50 days the Jews got together and they were having this feast. They didn't know what it was going to mean in the future and they still don't know. But we know because we've been enlightened by the, by the work of God. 22 verse 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you shall reap, nor shall you gather any gleaming from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I'm the Lord your God. One thing that happened at Pentecost that is quite astounding is that people filled with the Holy Spirit, they wanted to tell people about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. They wanted to tell others. And the term evangelism ridiculed this day. If you say you're evangel you believe in evangelism, you know, people change words and you know call it outreach and so forth, but they were out there. They were filled with the Spirit of God and they wanted to tell people that there's a Jesus Christ who can save and changes lives. And they went out. That's why it says here, you know what? The harvest, remember it says, you know, the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. Here he's they're telling the Jews, he's, he's directing the Jews, you know what? It's good when you get together. Really good. But leave some of the food, the grain, so other people can have it. So when you and I get together, in our heart should be, you know what? The stranger, the person that doesn't know. You know, give him some grain. And that grain is the, the essence of Jesus Christ. Give them some. Tell them about Jesus. And this was, was happening after the, this Pentecost, after the 50 days, after this moment. They, they went out, and this is the purpose. They went and collected the grain, the harvest, but they left some. Don't collect it all. Give it to the others. And we come here this morning as a church and we're feeding off the grain, all of us together, and we're feeding off the grain. But remember this, there's others too. The stranger, the foreigner, who they need to hear. Verse 23. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel. In the seventh month of the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of the trumpets, a holy convocation. You should do no customary work on it, and you should offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. When we look at the feasts, those feasts that we spoke about earlier, were there, they are considered to be springtime feasts. We see the, the harvest, of, uh, uh, the planting, we see all that happening there. And we can see they, when we look at the New Testament, they have happened. They have happened. Jesus died on the cross. He was resurrected from the dead. The church was filled with the Spirit of God. Evangelism was working and it was going all over the world. And now we get to this particular feast and the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. When we go to 1 Corinthians, it says the following. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised the incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put immorality, immortality. When this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put immor immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, 
Where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death was sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The feast of trumpets. There's going to be a trumpet one day. And we know this is the rapture of the children of God. There's going to be a moment. And when we look at the Old Testament, we could see raptures all the time. You know, we see people being taken, taken away, you know. Um, and it's going to happen. One day, you're going to see that Jesus says, God says, enough. Time has come. The sin of the world is at its most. People have accepted Christ and they'll be taken out. That's what rapture means. They'll be taken out of the world. And we read in other parts of the Bible, it says that, and we shall meet the Lord in the air when we hear the trumpet. When we hear the trumpet, we're gone. And then the Spirit of God goes, and then man is left with his own sin. No cleansing and directing power of the Spirit of God. No Christian to provide any insight to Jesus Christ. No Christian to provide any moral basis for living. And then the world is left without God. Many complain about God. But it'll be a time when he's, he's gone, his church is gone. And then people who don't want him are left in their sin. This morning, make sure you have Jesus Christ in your heart. You do not want to be left behind. The suffering of the Jews and what they went through, whether it be during World War II, uh, the Holocaust, and all throughout their history, they almost suffered many, many situations where they were decimated. And that's how it's going to be for the people left behind. The Bible talks about the Antichrist and how he's going to dominate. And we look at the world today and we can see, you know, the world's coming together slowly, slowly. One language is coming together slowly, slowly. English is dominating, you know. And you're going to have a situation where one world leader will come. We don't know when. But then the trumpet will sound. And those who are in Christ shall go up. Go up. That's what he says. And the Jews here, they celebrate the tr this feast of trumpets. They don't know exactly what it means, but they do it. They do it in an incredible way. And when we look at them and we see them, you know, we, we look at them thinking, thank you for celebrating it. Thank you for being and holding on to those things because we can see more. And many Jews are and have started to come to Christ. And at the end of the day, at the end of age, a lot of them will come to Jesus Christ. They will turn to uh, Jesus Christ and we hear Throughout the scripture, it says, you know what? Well, you know, they will mourn him who they have pierced. They will mourn Jesus Christ. Oh, what do we do? Remember, he was on the cross. And Pilate says, what shall we do with him? What shall we do with him? And they called out, crucify him, crucify him. And they said, you know, but what do you want? I said, no, 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 crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. If only knew what they were saying. Because we want his blood to be on us and our children. Because by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, we are saved. See, the Jews were doing things even today that I don't fully understand. When they follow the word of God, okay, they are, they are an example for us. And they are considered to be uh, brothers in a roundabout way. Remember in this part of the scripture earlier, about the two loaves. You shall wave the two loaves when, when uh, we read about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know that when we look at prophetically, the two loaves, one loaf is the old loaf, the Jews, and the, the, the new loaf is us, the Christian, coming together. The two loaves being under the auspices of God. Being under the auspices of God. But the trumpet will sound because the Bible says so. And the earth will change forever. Verse 33. We're going to get now to the feast of... No, no, sorry, verse 26. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer and be made with fire to the Lord. You shall do no work on that day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in the soul on the same day shall be cut off from the people. And any person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It will be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath, a solemn rest. You shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From the evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath, the day of atonement. And my mind turns to that moment in heaven. In heaven, where the Lamb, in Revelation chapter 5, the Lamb of God is there before the 24 elders. And they're asking the 24 elders, who can open up the seals? That is, you know, who, who, can, who can save the people? Who can do that? And they turn to the Lamb, the Lamb that had been slain. And we know, we know that Jesus Christ is the Lamb. And the 24 elders say this, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. The Day of Atonement is really holy. And it's a moment that I can see that it's a period in in heaven that it's confirmed that Jesus Christ died for all our sins. In heaven, we see this happening the 24 elders declaring, you are worthy. Day of atonement, the most holy day, when heaven and earth are joined together, that we can go there because of what he's done, what Jesus Christ has done. Let's go to verse 33. And this now talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, the fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You should do no custom work on it. For seven days you shall make an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall make an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is sacred assembly, and you shall do no custom work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you should proclaim to be holy convocations. An offer, an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice, a drink offering, everything in it today, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all the free will offerings which you give to the Lord. Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, you will have a gathered in the, in the fruit of the land, and you should keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there should be a Sabbath rest, and the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. And you should take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of the beautiful trees, the branches of the palm trees, the boars of the leafy trees, the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It will be a statute forever in your generation. You shall celebrate in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generation may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord, the feast of tabernacles. Between the 15th, 14th and 21st of October this year, the Jews celebrated this feast. And they celebrated the Orthodox Jews in particular, to the, to the T. They went outside in their backyards or wherever, somewhere on balconies, and they got the palm trees, and it says there, the, the branches of the leafy trees, the willows of the brooks of the, of the rivers, and they constructed a house. And for seven days... They slept in that house. And they were sleeping there. And throughout history, it's often been said that the father would call the son over and say, listen, come in here. Look at the branches. Look at the way they wither. 
Look at the way they're drying out. They covered us the first day from the elements, but now the sixth day, seventh day, they're all been withering away. And the example was, the reason was that things are temporary in this world. And for the Jews, it's really important because they're telling the kids, you know, the fancy house we've got. But a lot of them live in really good houses. It's only temporary. Come out one, once a year, live like this under these branches, under these things, just to remember that it's temporary. Just temporary. That's all it is. You know, when Jesus came to this world, he came and you can see he came for a temporary time. That is to dwell amongst us. And the Greek word says that, you know, he came and pitched his tent with us. In the same way, the, the tabernacles and the booths and the sukkut, that it was a temporary shelter. He came for a temporary moment. He came to die upon the cross, but he came and he dwelt amongst us. To recognise, and he paid and he did what he did, how he saved our souls. And then he was going to go to heaven, and he went to heaven, and he's calling out to us, he's calling out to us today, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when the Jews do the feast, to celebrate the feast of the tabernacles, for us, being illuminated by the Spirit of God, having his word before us, we can see that we are here for a temporary time also. We are pilgrims walking in this world. Jesus is calling out from heaven, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am you shall be also. And we know and we believe that and we've got to understand how we live our lives, how things are temporary. You know, sometimes you know it's good to catch public transport, and not to go into our air-conditioned cars, just to understand, you know, the Lord God has given us something that we can, you know, drive in and feel comfortable in, and we can do all those things more than any king and queen has done it for four or 5,000 years. In the same way, the Jews, they build this booth, they build this tent, they live in it, understanding the world, it's temporary. And, you know, the Lord has given us a wonderful, wonderful dwelling to live in, but it's temporary, because there's going to be a tabernacle in heaven. A tabernacle. And when we say tabernacle, it's a meeting place between God and man. It's a meeting place where God is going to be there with man. And we know, looking at the Israelites' history, when they built a tabernacle. And it was a portable tabernacle. Remember? They had its design. They had the elements in there. And it was taken. And it was moved with them wherever they went. It was temporary. Then we come to Revelation. A revelation says the following. If you want to read with me Revelations 21. Revelations 21. <coughs> Revelations 21. Now I saw a new heaven <coughs> and a new earth. For the first heaven and the, <coughs> and the first Earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
There should be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's the tabernacle to come. We thank the Jews, especially those who are Orthodox Jews, and they stick to the tradition, the, uh, the scripture. You know, when they listen to the rabbis, they add a lot of other stuff. That's what's a bit confusing sometimes. You look at them and you think, you know, what are they doing? But it's the added stuff that the rabbis add. But when they come to know Jesus Christ, they'll throw them all away and they'll just stick to the word of God. But we know, and look, and this is how blessed we are, people. This is how blessed we are. We can look at the Old Testament and we can look at it like no other person can look at it. I'm saying Christian. And we can see we can see the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We can see the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can see the day of Pentecost. We can see and we know Jesus Christ is coming back and he's coming back soon. The trumpet's going to sound and we will be whisked away. And we can see he's preparing a place for us. And what did it cost us? Faith in him. Faith in God. And we have our eyes illuminated. You know, every time we come to church, we should be praising God on the way home. That his wonderful truths are in our hearts and minds. And this is a holy convocation. When the church gets together and his truth is declared, there's a meeting between God and man like no other. The Bible says, we're two or three are here. And if even if there's two or three people, Jesus Christ is in the midst. He's here. And we look at his word. Something that the scholars are trying to work out. And the Jews don't fully comprehend it. But you and I, because we know Christ and we've been born from above, we have the spirit of God within our hearts. We can see it and we should be rejoicing. You know, knowledge, you know, people want knowledge. Education is huge. I want to know this, I want to know that. But most of the knowledge relates to here, and it's good to have. You're successful and so forth and so on. But this is eternal knowledge. To know that Jesus Christ died, he came to this world, and he paid for our sins, and he was resurrected from the dead, and you and I are going to be with him. That's why we rejoice. That's why we're wrapped. That's why we look at this word and we think, praise be to God. You know, it's not just words that we say, you know what, your word is a light unto our path. It has meaning and depth. And we're not going to go to hell. We're not going to be eternally separated from God. But because of Jesus Christ, we will be with him forever and ever in that tabernacle, in the new heaven and the new earth. You ask anybody, say, what's it going to be like exactly what we don't know? Because the Bible says to us, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered the heart of man what God has got prepared for those that love him. We can't fully comprehend it. We can't be able to do that. But this morning we should be rejoicing within our hearts that God is with us and we can see him and we can experience him here this morning and we can know that he is guiding us. And we all of us ask, you know, Lord, help us comprehend that we're pilgrims. We're just pilgrims on this earth. Don't put our roots in here, but look above. You know, the Bible says to us, if you've been raised with Christ, seek those things above. Seek them. Seek them in every way, knowing that, as we've read, it's temporary. But these things that we speak about and what the Jews declare in their feasts are eternal. May God bless his wonderful word in our hearts this morning.